What's going on, everybody? I'm Jabby Kowei, joined by Sintel Kowei. Hey, what's cracking, baby? <laughs> there's a slight, there's a slight delay for some reason today. I don't know why. There's like a two, two and a half second delay where I'm just kind of like hanging, waiting for Sintel to respond. We're watching <laughs> India's plan to trap and checkmate China. If at any point there's like this odd space between me saying something and Sintel responding, assuming the editors don't cut it out. It's just because of the, like the, the time delay for some odd reason. Discord is just playing nice today. It's, thank you, Discord. <laughs> anyway, this is from Business Basics, the YouTube channel. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, bell icon, all notifications, vote this up. Let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're watching while you're subscribing and upvoting. Subscribe to Business Basics. There is a link in the description below. Here we go. India has launched a war against China. And it's really? not a war that will be fought on the battlefield. Rather, it's a war that will be fought economically. Okay. India I was about to say. India emerging as the next great powerhouse of Asia in order to counter I was about China's to say, aggression. dude, like, I I India's India. not the aggressor between India and China at all. So I was like, what? You better, <laughs> you better be going somewhere good with this, dude. <laughs> it's itself as an alternative for companies that are getting tired of being used like a pawn in the CCP's grand ambition mm. towards taking over the world. Gotcha. Mm. Companies like Apple are already moving to India to yep. set up for a world Facts. after China. Yep. India has slowly launched its own global projects to counteract China's growing influence from the Belt and Road Initiative. Prime Minister Modi has started India's own lending program for its neighbors in order to mm. stop China from gaining influence by using its debt trap diplomacy. Mm. So today, let's go over how India became China's greatest threat. The head of MI6 last year accused China of using debt traps to gain leverage over countries. Sri Lanka sought China's financial help. The country took loans worth $45 billion from various countries, including more than $8 billion from China. An agreement mm. for a $1 billion US dollar credit line from India. The fast patrol vessel will be the fourth ship to be gifted by India to Seychelles. Pakistan is all set to receive a $700 million loan from China to help it shore its foreign exchange reserves, which mm. are at a 10-year low. This video took a lot of effort. Recently, my- Ch China is just like Oprah on the world theater, dude. <laughs> you get some money, you get some money. Everybody look at this, see how I got money! <laughs> oh my God, oh. Yeah, but you owe me! Exactly, yes. I'm gonna call in that debt. The videos have been getting age restricted, which severely hurts their reach with the algorithm. That's stupid. And doesn't really make that much sense. So if you guys can please take a second and hit the like button below, it will help me out a lot. YouTube is just age-restricting so much stuff. So let's start from the beginning. Something that might surprise most of you is the fact that historically, India and China were strong allies and friendly economic partners. That doesn't surprise me at the all. The Silk Road linked the cities of Xi'an in China and Pataliputra in India. Trade on the tea and horse road, as the Chinese called it, was a significant factor in the growth of Chinese and Indian civilizations. Coming into mm. modern history, both civilizations had their hands full with their colonizers, as mm. India had the British and China had the Japanese. Yep. That didn't stop their leaders from supporting each other. Even under British rule, Indian leaders publicly showed their support for China's struggles against the Japanese. In 1939, future Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, visited China as an honored guest of the government. Both countries mm. actually helped each other in their battles. India helped China against the Japanese and Western imperialism, and in return, China supported India's independence movement against the British. Then, in 1947, India gained its independence from the British Empire. And two years later, in 1949, the People's Republic of China, or PRC, came into power in China. This is where the relationship could have soured. Up to this point, Indian leaders had been friendly with the ROC, the Republic of China. When Mao Zedong's PRC came into power, the ROC fled mainland China and took over Taiwan. I'm sure mm. you guys are already familiar with the China-Taiwan issue, so I won't go into it right now. But good relations between the two nations continued, even under new leadership. In fact, India was one of the first countries in the world to recognize the People's Republic of China as the official government of China. Mm. Indian Prime Minister mm. Jawaharlal Nehru also became the first foreign leader to visit the PRC in China in 1954. 
this time to meet with the PRC leader, Mao Zedong. Nehru described the visit as Hold the on, I, I just want to, I want to like com compliment the music choices here. I love like the Metal Gear Solid espionage kind of sound <laughs> that he's got underscoring this whole thing. That's pretty fun. With regards to the relationship between India and China being friends at one point, that doesn't surprise me in the slightest. We are constantly oscillating between friendship and enemies in the, the grand stage of things. It's just like constantly fighting, constantly friends. It's like, it depends on the situation, the circumstances. Oh, we're buddies right now because we got to kick their ass. <laughs> it's like, then once that's out of the way and now now we got to deal with each other man in the high castle dealt with the same uh concept if you're not familiar with man in the high castle it's an alternate version of history where the nazis and the japanese won world war ii and after they took over the americas or whatever then they had to contend with each other it's just that's how history is always playing out you know right, most important right. foreign mission of his life he considered india and china to be very similar he believed as a newly free nation they couldn't trust the West. Mm. They needed to depend on each other to grow their economy and improve living conditions for their citizens. Okay. That makes sense. They jointly signed and advocated for the five principles of peaceful coexistence. But peace, it didn't last long. Nope, never does. As soon as the CCP came into power in 1950, they forcibly took over the autonomous region of Tibet by sending loads of military personnel. Yeah. I have a full video on the story, which was actually demonetized this, and restricted by this YouTube. This became a the first real time I bad situation. It, times. I highly recommend you check it out for the full details on this story. You know what India but did? Here's a quick recap. <clears throat> After taking over the region in 1950, the CCP slowly kept increasing its military presence in Tibet. As you can imagine, this really pissed off the local Tibetan population as the CCP mm. was not giving them their religious and cultural freedom. Chairman Mao wanted Tibet to be a Chinese territory. It didn't matter to him that the people there had their own culture and history. So in 1958, a rebellion broke out in Tibet against CCP forces. Tibetans mm. wanted to kick out the CCP and take back their land. But Mao decided to send in even more forces to reassert his dominance. Local Tibetan rebels stood no chance against the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, who had a numbers mm. advantage and experience on their side. India was closely following this clampdown. Yep. India had always had a friendly relationship with Tibet, mm -hmm. including an economic relationship where North India would freely trade with Tibet. Indian leaders decided not to get involved in this fight, as to not cause a war with their neighbor. Mao, mm -hmm. on the other hand, did not share the same feelings about keeping the peace. Declassified documents from decades later have shown that Mao was always paranoid that India was colluding with the USA and the Soviets to overthrow Chinese leadership. Looking back, this really doesn't make any sense. The USA and the USSR were in a pretty intense Cold War in the 1960s. And while India was a neutral nation that was friendly with both sides, I highly doubt the USA and the Soviet Union would set aside the Cold War and collude together to overthrow the leadership in China. I don't uh, wholly agree with that. I think that proxy wars have been going on forever. It's entirely possible that China was suspicious from their perspective for good reason. It could have been entirely possible at the time that USA was using India as a proxy, you know, thing. Do you know about the Nanking Massacre? I think that's what it's called. No. I can't talk in too much detail about it because it's so graphic. It's so awful okay. what happened. Basically, it was when the Japanese were invading China. It was such an awful situation that it gave me some perspective on why China made the moves that it made in the years to come. It's almost like, you know, you, okay, for me, for instance, I grew up with, you know, rough situation with my, with my dad, and I never quite understood why until I spoke with his family members and found out what my dad went through growing up. And I'm like, ah, that makes sense now. <laughs> my childhood okay. is rough. <laughs> you know, okay. because my dad had it way worse than I did. That's not to justify anything China's doing. It's just like getting more perspective. If you don't know anything about the Nanjing Massacre, let me just like fact check that, that name real quick. Sorry. Oh, Nanjing Massacre is also what it's called. Oh, man. I was like watching a video about it, which was very just like dry. It mm -hmm. still brought tears to my eyes because mm. it was so, such a bad situation. Anyway, let's, let's continue okay. forward here. Anyway, coming back to the Tibet story. In 1959, the Dalai Lama, fearing for his life in Tibet, fled to India, mm -hmm. where he was granted asylum. That created problems. This, of course, didn't please Chairman Mao, as he saw this action as India playing a role in supporting the rebels against yeah. the CCP. Exactly. Mm. This, in turn, made him more aggressive towards India, and Mao decided to show his aggression by encroaching on India's borders. Speaking mm. of borders, there's one point I quickly want to go over that's actually pretty important. 
In 1914, while India was still under British control, representatives from Britain, China, and Tibet gathered to determine the status of Tibet. China agreed to allow Tibet to be an autonomous region and remain under Chinese control, but they refused to put the promise in a treaty. Britain and Tibet, on the other hand, signed a treaty creating this line called the McMahon Line. India, okay. to this day, accepts the McMahon Line as the official legal border between India and Tibet. The CCP, on the other hand, well, they didn't accept the McMahon Line. And in 1959, they kept pushing the limits at these borders to show their displeasure. This caused both sides to increase their military presence around the border. And mm. then, in August of 1959, the first bloody clash erupted between the two nations. On the west side of the border, Chinese soldiers pushed into Indian territory. Then, a month later, clashes happened on the east border. This is when India learned that China had built a road inside of Indian territory. Wow. Which has remained a pretty big issue to this day. To settle huh. these issues, China offered India the west side of the border if India agrees to give China more territory on the east side. India, of course, declined this offer, and firefights kept happening for the next few years. Mm. Then, in 1962, Chinese soldiers discovered an Indian post in territory that they believed to be under China's borders. This news traveled to Mao, and he saw this as the final straw. Mao decided huh. to send tens of thousands of soldiers in secret to both east and west sides of disputed borders. The People's Liberation Army swiftly launched an attack on both sides, surprising the Indian soldiers who were both outnumbered and inexperienced. The PLA, on the other hand, had plenty of fighting experience from their wars in Korea, Vietnam, and Taiwan. Indian troops suffered a humiliating defeat, Damn. and the CCP was able to capture much of Indian territory. The Indian okay. Army tried setting up a counteroffensive by bringing in more soldiers, but Mao was ready for it, and squashed it pretty easily. This is when India asked the USA military for help to take back its territory. And USA didn't At help. this time, the USA was one of the only two countries who had nukes, the second one being the Soviet Union. Surprisingly, this was also one of the few issues that the USA and the Soviets agreed on. They both saw China as the aggressor in this situation. And since China didn't want to experience their own Hiroshima, they decided to withdraw most of their troops oh. from Indian territory. Mm. Oh. However, the CCP did decide to keep control of a piece of Indian territory here in the Aksai China region. Is it clear here from the video that USA backed India in this particular instance? At least they made it publicly known that we're not feeling what China's doing. Yeah. And we got we got these big boy bombs back here. So okay. we need to chill out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because at some point there was a conflict, I, I guess, between India and Pakistan. Russia mm -hmm. is, backed India while US backed Pakistan. So I was like, uh, I wasn't I wasn't anticipating US to have India's back here. Area where they had built a road connecting Xiangsheng to Lhasa. Remember this as this is an issue still to this day. Another ideological goal Mao had with this attack was to stop India from aligning with the USA in the Cold War. Mao's thinking was that if he can show India that China is much stronger, India will be afraid to do anything that will piss off China. But this attack kind of caused the exact opposite to happen. India and the US had become even closer as oh. they both now had a common enemy in China. Okay. This war also changed the borders between India and China. Now, this is where the problems start. China attacked India, captured territory, and the new unofficial border was basically in Indian territory. In 1967, another war broke out, and this time India was able to push back some of the Chinese soldiers and regain some of its territories. All right. This changed what China controlled in terms of territory versus what China believed to be its territory. China okay. believes that everything claimed in 1962 is a part of China, but it lost some of that in 1967. India still honors the McMahon Line Agreement and believes that China is still illegally occupying Indian territory. This is the reason behind a lot of subsequent clashes that have happened here. Both countries have soldiers patrolling the area, and both countries have different definitions of where their borders end. I mean, you can tell why this is a recipe for clashes, right? Yeah. Luckily, both countries realized that. But China refused to come to a peaceful agreement about the border dispute. However, they did agree that soldiers from both countries cannot use military weapons against each other, meaning no guns what? allowed in the two-mile strip around the supposed line of actual control. 
These border disagreements are a big reason behind the India-China bitterness towards each other. But the problems don't stop here. As China grew economically, its ambitions on the world stage grew as well. After Mao's passing, Deng Xiaoping opened China up to the rest of the world with his open-door policy. This policy quite literally changed China's economy and its place in the world. It was able to attract foreign businesses to China and quickly transform the country into a manufacturing hub. Millions of people were lifted out of poverty, and China went from a farming nation to the second biggest economy in the world. But as the population started getting older and growth from attracting foreign manufacturing slowed down, the CCP was forced to look elsewhere for future growth. So it decided to feed two birds with one scone. You see, for a nation to be a superpower, for it to be a formidable force on the world stage, it needs to increase its influence with other nations, and it needs to decrease its dependency on its enemies. In short, China needed to get stronger and minimize its weaknesses. Now we skip forward a little bit in our story, because this plan was set in motion by Xi Jinping when he was elected. Taking the center stage, China's new president and commander-in-chief of the People's Liberation Army, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping. As votes were counted, there was little surprise. He got 99.86% of the God vote. damn. China's Belt Goodness. and Road Initiative. The BRI is a gigantic plan for a global network of ports, roads, railways, and other infrastructure to connect China to the world. After being elected president, Xi Jinping launched the most ambitious project in history to increase China's influence around the world. China would give out loans to poor struggling nations in the guise of helping nations yeah. that once struggled like they did. Started with Africa. But in return, China gained control over countries with valuable resources or in a strategic location. Now you may ask, what if these poor countries can't pay back the loans? Well, China would then get control over important resources like gold, silver, oil, and access. And China not just, not just that, but like, used but votes at the UN. You must be familiar with what they did in Africa, right? Like, oh yeah, the the and still no, what they did, they are continuing to do. <laughs> right, 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 right. If you watch um, *Beasts of No Nation*, they hint at this tiny bit towards the end of the film, where you see like a mm -hmm. Chinese representative about to have a meeting with. Anyway, it just messes me up just how mafia-like the moves were because they're like here we'll lend you this money but you have to use chinese supplies you have to have a chinese supervisor and you have to use the money from the loan we give you to pay them the idea is all the same but the way they're going about it is different of how they used to do it back in the day back in the back when when colonizers would just come over and just literally just take over and set up shop and there is no contract or anything it's just this is ours now yeah but so now it's the the principle is still the same but how they're going about it they're using uh economic leverage yeah yeah, yeah, in, in order to, to get the same results. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Loans to gain influence on struggling nations and also choke out its enemies. A prime example being India. If you look mm. at the map of the Belt and Road Initiative, you can clearly see that there's one country that's left out. Not only <laughs> that, it seems like India is being encircled by this project that is controlled by China. Before we get into how Man. China is doing that exactly, let's first go over why China is doing this. You see, China believes it needs to do this in order to survive. China's right. economy is very interconnected to the rest of the world, especially to Western countries. Well, Around they're, they're one a big fifth exporter. of China's GDP is from its exports, yeah. the USA yep. being its biggest export partner, accounting for more than $500 billion or 17% of all of China's exports. Wow. Yeah. The dependency doesn't stop there. If you look at China's top 10 export partners, Nine of them are U.S. allies. Wow. More than 50% of China's exports are going to countries that are likely to side with the USA if there's a war. Additionally, China is wow. one of the biggest importers of oil. China imports almost double the amount of oil that the USA does, and the majority of that oil flows from the Middle East, which is transported through the Indian Ocean. All of this oil passes through what some might consider to be one of the most important geopolitical choke points Right. Here yeah. in the Strait of Malacca. I was about to say that. Wow. Like, if there, if if India and China ever went to war, India just has to cut off that route. I, I watched a whole video about this. Like, there's a lot of power that India can exercise right there. It's crazy. It's projected mm. that 80% of China's oil flows yep. through this strait. 
what you just this said. strait is in the territorial waters of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. This strait is a very big weakness for China. In case of any war or political disagreement, this strait could easily be blocked off by enemies like India or the USA. Yeah. Without access to this route, it's very hard for China to get the energy to fuel its economy, let alone a war. In today's world, oil is the lifeblood of the economy right. and its government. That's right. China's right. solution to this problem is to build its own alternate route using the Belt and Road Initiative. China has built pipelines both in Myanmar and Pakistan from the coast to intercity China. It secured long port leases in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Similarly, China has also set up a military base in Djibouti to control Bab el Mandeb, a vital strait off the coast of Djibouti that links the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Persian huh. Gulf and Asian exports bound for Western markets must first pass through Bab el Mandeb before reaching the Suez Canal. Between 12.5 and 20% of all global trade passes through this strait. Only 8 miles hmm. from China's base is Camp Limanier. After seeing all the moves China has been making, a lot of military experts have pointed out that the Belt and Road is not just a geo-economic plan. It also has a military strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. The ports have increasingly come to play a potentially more menacing role as dual-use ports that can give the strengthened Chinese Navy a global reach it lacked entirely just a few years ago. Mm. These strategic investments are nicknamed the String of Pearls, as the goal mm. is to encircle India and put pressure on New Delhi. India was aware of this already, but the war in Ukraine showed every country in the world how important it is to secure your economic interest. In mm. the modern world, wars can be won and lost before even stepping foot on the battlefield. India realized that, in the case of a war, China's string of pearls can be used as a way to choke off India's access to the world, on top of safeguarding Chinese interests. Adding to this, countries that received Chinese money were slow to criticize China whenever it would start exactly. skirmishes on the disputed border exactly. with India, like it did in 2017 and 2020. There's also a rumor that China plans to start setting up military bases in countries that received Chinese loans. <laughs> that and of sounds course, very it, American. That sounds extremely American. You know, it's just it's just <laughs> wild to me. It's like, yeah. like you know, because the, the UN meeting, it's like, yo, look what China did. And the, the, the countries receiving money are like, they're like, oh, huh? God, I didn't, did you huh? see something? I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. Did you see, did you see an attack? I didn't see an attack. <laughs> they doing that for real? Yeah, exactly. Man. <laughs> Hey, what's that over there? <laughs> God, this money in my pocket is so yeah. hot in here. <laughs> it's so, so warm. Exactly. <laughs> I just, oh, golly. Like, we can't leave well enough alone, huh? Damn. And of course, this was undoubtedly stressful for New Delhi, as it didn't want to be surrounded by the Chinese military. So India started laying out its own plan to safeguard its economic interests. But it didn't just stop there. Later in the video, we'll go over how India is taking advantage of China's trade war with the USA to hurt China where it's the strongest, mm. its manufacturing prowess. But first, mm. let's go over how India is countering China's military. To counter the string of pearls, India started its own alliance to encircle China, nicknamed the Necklace of Diamonds. <laughs> India is expanding its naval bases and is also improving relations with strategically placed countries to counter China's strategies. In 2018, India partnered with Singapore and Indonesia to get access to their naval bases of Changi and Sabang. This increased India's influence and access to the Strait of Malacca, one of the most important choke points for China and the rest of the world in terms of trade. That same year, India also got military access to the port of Dukum in Oman. This port okay. facilitates India's crude imports from the Persian Gulf. In addition to this, the Indian facility is located right between two important Chinese pearls, Djibouti in Africa and Gwadar in Pakistan. Mm. India has also signed an agreement with Seychelles for a naval base in the region, which will increase India's presence near the African continent. While doing this, India has also extended credit lines to Iran and agreed to build a port in the country to extend access to trade routes in Central Asia. Hmm. Additionally, India has extended credit lines in Central Asia to countries like Mongolia, where Modi has agreed to develop a bilateral air corridor. That is dangerous. New Delhi has in Mongolia? 
Yo, you know anything about the history of Mongolia? The only reason Mongolia is still existing right now is because Russia propped it up as like a proxy effort of some kind. Because China okay. wanted to take over. And Russia's like, no, no, no. And China's like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like the, Mongolia is caught between a rock and a hard place because basically like they're at the, the, the center of all of this and stuff is kind of going through their country, whether they like it or not, whether or not they huh. want it, China's coming in there and doing what they got to do. And Russia's coming in there too. It's just like, it's nuts. So for India to, to put itself in there, I'm like, oh man, like you're right there in enemy territory. <laughs> like, mm. That's really close to the action, buddy. They got some kind of plan. It's invested yeah. a lot in policies to improve relations with Japan and Vietnam. These relations have helped increase Indian trade and consequently India's influence on countries around China. Yep. But India realized this alone isn't enough. It has also taken big steps towards speeding up its economic growth while taking business away from China. Mm. You see, the China-US trade war and COVID provided countries like India with a unique opportunity. Because of economic growth in the past couple of decades, living standards and wages in China have gone up dramatically. This has become an issue for companies that moved to China for their low labor costs. Furthermore, tariffs from the trade war have added even more costs, and the headache of operating in China increased multiple fold because of Xi's COVID clampdown. This mm. is where companies started looking outwards for their manufacturing needs. Mm -hmm. For many countries, India provided a perfect solution. India's population is fast growing and according to the UN, it's officially now the biggest nation in the world. Wow. Overtaking China this year. Wow. Furthermore, yeah. the Indian Yo. population is yeah. a lot younger when compared to China's aging demographic. That's because of the one child age policy. In India is 28 a lot younger when compared to China's 38. A big portion of Indian wow. workers speak English. In fact, India has the second largest English-speaking population only behind the USA. This definitely makes things a lot easier for wow. companies looking to set up shop in India. Certain companies have already noticed these benefits and taken advantage of them. One example mm. of this is Apple, which has already moved some of its iPhone production to the Indian states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and mm. is exploring moving its iPad manufacturing to the South Asian nation. JP Morgan analysts even made calculations, and their projections show that one in four iPhones would be made in India by 2025. Uh. India is simply capitalizing on the vulnerabilities that COVID exposed in China. The need for Apple to reduce its dependence on China as a manufacturing center has been clear for many years, but the impact of the pandemic at the world's biggest iPhone assembly plant really underlined the problem. This actually makes me quite happy in a sadistic kind of way, because I had okay. heard that when uh, COVID hit, China was buying up a lot of uh, US stock to gain okay. more control. There's that famous adage, follow the money. It seemed very suspect that like, as soon as COVID hit, China was ready to buy up shit from the US, and which they've been yeah. doing for a long time. They've been buying real estate for a long time. And they're getting into our movies as well. Like you see these Chinese logos at the beginning of films because they're financing mm -hmm. our films as well to have control over that. China is, is uh, responsible for a huge number of the box office receipts from US films and stuff like that. So yeah. we're constantly having this weird navigation. Like Iron Man 3 has a whole 45 minute segment that the US has never seen that was just for China. Hearing this, I'm like, Cool, I'm glad India took advantage of COVID when it was happening. China's <laughs> making these moves and India's like, we got you though, we got your number. <laughs> <laughs> this shift of the of Apple into India, I'd, I'd seen that coming from a, like miles away before it happened and I'm glad it's, I, I thought by now we'd actually have it be much further along than it is. 25% is not insignificant, that's, that's huge. I just That's massive. Yeah, but I thought it would be like way more than that by now. Seeing all the footage that has come out, like some of the stuff they showed, I thought okay. that in the US would be like, yo, we need to get the hell out of Dodge completely. I guess you, you, it's, that's impossible. Due to some of the terms of the of the trade conditions, like there's penalties for, for oh. the US and for China, depending on how much they import, I mean, how much they export and how much the United States imports, taking certain companies uh, away from China, there's penalties and tariffs oh. and taxes and stuff that go along with it. So there's there's fine print so that uh, companies like Apple just can't be like, well, I'm gonna just take all my stuff and then go over here. Yeah. So there's pressure. Cause it, yeah, you can't just like, you know, I'm gonna take my ball and go home. Gotcha. Really underlined the problem. The COVID-19 related disruption was estimated to cost the company a billion dollars weekly. Jesus, it makes sense weekly? that Apple wants to avoid this kind of mess oh. again. 
The Indian government is welcome wow. to deals, as Indian Prime Minister Modi has been working on attracting foreign direct investments since he took office in 2014, mm. sending FDI to a record $83.6 billion in the past fiscal year. Wow. With low-cost labor available, low cost of production, and a willing government, it's not hard to see why a good portion of business is leaving China for India. At the current rate, India stands to take a lot of China's business. Mm. Because of all this, mm. the UN predicts that India's economy is expected to grow at 6.7% in 2024, mm. compared to the measly 5% expected by China's economy. And it's not just next year. Many organizations forecast that India's economy is expected to grow at a much faster rate for years to come, wow. compared to China's economy. India has already started putting this growth to good use. It's now lending money to neighbors in order to avoid having them indebted to Chinese loans. Wow. It has given hmm. $8 billion to Bangladesh, $2.1 billion to bail out Sri Lanka after a recent collapse, $1.7 billion to Nepal, $13 billion to the Maldives, and a few more. While India lags far behind China in its overseas lending, New Delhi has stepped up its efforts in recent years providing tens of billions of dollars in credit to neighboring countries, including financially distressed BRI recipients like Sri Lanka. Indian companies have also expanded rapidly in the region, providing a counterweight to Chinese commercial activity. Mm. Indian policymakers see countering BRI as vital to avoid being surrounded by pro-Chinese governments and infrastructure they speculate could one day serve Beijing's military interests. India has definitely stepped up its efforts in containing China. India publicly downplays the competition with China, but its <laughs> actions show India doesn't want to be held hostage to China's economic or military might. Mm. Recently, the first bloody clashes in 45 years took place at the India-China border. But you might not have seen this news because a lot of traditional news organizations are not good at properly covering important geopolitical news. That's why I launched Global Recaps, a geopolitical newsletter that covers important geopolitical news in a simplified manner. I like that. That's really cool. Yeah, I wasn't um, business basics, huh? Yeah. I, gotta, I have to start keeping my eyes on that. Uh, and of course, obviously, to everybody that's, that's watching, please support the channel because they gave us some great content. Thank you. Yeah, Thank no, you he, he, he did a really good job of making that bite-sized and digestible and interesting in the script he reeled you in in terms of like the setup and payoff uh the music yeah. was nice like it was just nicely put together he made sure to constantly give credit to the sources of where he was pulling clips from i thought this was yeah. a fantastic video um the, the, his i don't know if it's one guy or, or a team but it was great uh, it really like giving you some sharp insight into the ongoings um what without boring you you know yeah that's the thing it kept me uh it never dropped me off right yeah. you know there was uh it, it was always intriguing i was like oh well, there's a good bit of information yeah well well done i, I learned a significant amount like a yeah. surprising uh amount i didn't i mean I, i'd heard about the string of pearls i never heard anything about the diamonds and the thing is is that i'm so boxed in and listening to my own echo chamber of just what's going on with american politics that i don't give the attention to what's going on the global playing field the, the proper attention that it deserves yeah um, so the, the significance behind, you know, the economic powerhouses between India and China is absolutely fascinating because it's big money. It's big money. Yeah. Big moves are being made economically and potentially defensively with, with military might as well. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, our real life Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is based off of real world politics. But yeah. to see our real world politics play out in real time, absolutely fascinating. The thing about it is we are taught to be distracted and we've been taught that from a young age to be distracted by our toys. Um, our history is more focused on U.S. history than world history. And that is often written by from a biased perspective, if that makes any sense. I mean, you, history, yeah. history always is. But um, I think that paying attention to this stuff is quite important for anyone who, I don't know, just wants to broaden their horizons first off at a basic level. But secondly, you're following the money. You know, um, the, the the Belt Road Initiative or whatever it's called and versus what India is doing, that is informing where all the money's headed, you know, yeah. and, and what conflicts are, are uh, ahead of us. I feel like most Americans don't realize any of this shit, any no. of it. 
like 99 percent of americans yeah. are clueless i'll go i'll go as far as to say that it's a yeah. very 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 small amount yeah but this is huge yeah. and like yes. the ramifications of it the potential fallout from it is crazy to think about like china has get, been getting more and more and more aggressive ever since they formed their their new unit uh, so uh but like i said you know the the non Jing massacre it's like when you have something like that china got hit fucking hard by the japanese and so what you have in response is like this very aggressive tactic to be like to never suffer again to never be hit like right. that again is the way i kind of interpret it it's almost mm -hmm. like you know you get robbed once or something like that so you buy every fucking gun in the shop you know it's it's uh, it's like that kind of attitude mm -hmm. that's how i see it from like a removed perspective you know, right. um, America in its own way has kind of done the same thing. It's like, I know, kind of. Yeah, we, we, we basically yeah. did. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> yeah, that's what Oppenheimer was all about, I guess. So China's basically got the same attitude we do, but I feel like, I don't know, I guess maybe because I'm American, I'm seeing it differently. China just looks more aggressive to me. I guess we are just as aggressive using our proxy wars and stuff like that and installing leaders and whatever. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. So I guess we're just as bad, but I'm here, and so I'm rooting for my team. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, is yeah. It? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, one of the things that I enjoy was, was perspective, too. Like, we're hearing, like, the effects of, you know, stopping certain shipping routes and ports and, and all this, but they did something that... The, that's contextually a little bit easier for me to process and they said they said like during uh COVID, uh apple was like losing a billion dollars and i was like dang i was like a billion dollars that's nothing for about a week apple. and they were like a week yeah and i was like oh yeah ow. yeah <laughs> i was like okay i can understand why a company would be like you know what i can't really rock with y'all like that anymore yeah. because Y'all are messing with my pocket. I could get that, you know. Yeah. But meanwhile, you know, other other people was like, "Hey, I'm going to bring that business on over here." You know, yeah. <laughs> our ports and doors stay open. Yeah, <laughs> I guess the thing to think about is, you know, because this is I I feel like it's talking about the next five to ten, and so the thing to think about that I don't really necessarily have an answer to is what is the next 10 to 30 you know what i mean yeah. in terms of years like okay because like everything kind of shifts around and history repeats itself so what comes next that's my question that i'm going to leave you guys with in the comments you know um and you know be as objective as you can because it's like china's coming in with just crazy relentless ambition and confidence <laughs> like full degaf mode they're in the south china sea in the 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 seven lines or whatever the seven dash line whatever that thing is called mm -hmm. you know what i'm talking about the pearls you're talking about the... I, I forget i, I always f up the name but um mm -hmm. basically they are building artificial islands for their military they keep encroaching oh. they keep encroaching upon other areas in south asia and like mm -hmm. america had to step in and be like yo like you can't be here <laughs> you, you gotta back <laughs> off <laughs> Get, getting closer and closer i think india might have stepped in as well i can't remember but anyway let us know in the comments below where you think things are headed in the next 10 to tw 10 to 30 years i'd be i'd be very mm -hmm. curious to hear from you guys thanks so much for hanging out i'm jabby koi this is ace voice intel peace out